You're listening to The Luxury Item, the podcast on the business of luxury and the people and companies that are shaping the future of the luxury industry. Here's your host, Scott Kerr. My guest on The Luxury Item is Simon Kim, founder and CEO of Gracious Hospitality Management, the brand behind Michelin-starred Cote Korean Steakhouse in Manhattan's Flatiron District, Miami's Design District, and newly opened one in Singapore. Cote Steakhouse has changed the way people interact with their beef, merging a classic American steakhouse with Korean influences. Aside from the three Cote Korean steakhouses, Simon Kim's portfolio also includes bespoke cocktail lounge under Cote and most recently the opening of Kokodak in New York City, a high-end Korean fried chicken and champagne concept that reimagines fried chicken in a more elevated setting. Some of Simon's many honors include EY Entrepreneur of the Year New York winner, Crane's 40 Under 40 honoree, and recipient of the Next Generation Award from the New York City Hospitality Alliance. He is also a passionate advocate for supporting local New York City and Asian American communities, working closely with a variety of organizations, including Apex for Youth, City Harvest, World Central Kitchen, and more. Welcome to The Luxury Item, Simon. Thank you, Scott. So happy to be here. Yes, yeah, so glad you can join me. So congratulations on the opening of Coco Dak, this new fine dining and Korean fried chicken and champagne cathedral. I've seen it called a temple into your hospitality portfolio. And this project has been four years in the making. How did this whole concept come about? Well, Scott, I'm a carnivore. So <laughs> I have my coat. And when I finished working at Coat, uh, me and my chef David and the chef SK, where, where do we want to go after the um Long day at a steakhouse. Uh, I, I always like going to Korean fried chicken place. So we would go there, um, and I enjoyed it thoroughly, that casual environment and fried chicken. You know, everybody loves fried chicken. Scott, yep. do you love fried chicken? I love it. You know, it seemed like more and more I asked about fried chicken, more and more the validation of that everybody loves fried chicken was confirmed. And um, But I was looking for something more, right? I'm a gastronome. I'm a restaurateur. I'm a father. Uh, I care about the ingredients and and the taste and what it you know the impact that it has on you, the planet, etc. And I realized uh, what I'm looking for didn't really exist. So we set out. Um, we said um, we got to do our own. The the goal was to create a better fried chicken, right? So um, how can we um, procure a chicken that's um, part of regenerative farming? Uh, it's better for you. It's certified humane. It's grown by uh, 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 farmers in Amish Farm in Pennsylvania. So it's better chicken. And also, uh, we created this um, Chef SK, got into a test kitchen for 11 months. Mm -hmm. And it was frying chicken like eight, nine hours a day for six days a week for 11 <laughs> months. Uh, and he created this batter that is um, naturally gluten free. And because it's made with uh, rice flour, it retains about 40 to 60% less fat on the batter. So what you have is a lot crispier and uh, um, uh, cleaner tasting um, chicken, fried chicken. Also, what you fry in matters. We all hear about the negative quality of seed oils. And we replace those seed oil with this oil called cultured oil. It's made by fermenting sugarcane. So, and it's the sugar cane is sourced in a certified non deforestation, non GMO in Brazil. So, uh, what you have is a, a oil that's a lot better for you with a lot higher monosaturated fat, uh, almost like olive oil, but a lot higher smoke point. So, and also, it's better for the environment. And that, that was the kind of the stemming point. You know, we wanted to create something better, not just taste, not just for us, but as well as environment. And Coco Dac is also championing champagne. You opened up Coco Dac with 400 champagnes among the 600 labels on the wine list with plants to grow even more. And champagne is taken so seriously and fried chicken typically isn't. So why the pairing? Well, number one, I love champagne. And uh, <laughs> Victoria James, she loves champagne as well. Everyone at my company really enjoys champagne. And as you mentioned, Scott, people think champagne is serious. Nothing can be like further from its true. Champagne is basically white wine with a uh, um, carbonation, right? right? Like you can never go wrong with it. So personally, um, I love champagne. And as we launch this better fried chicken, a fried chicken that everybody loves, 
uh, chicken that basically has all the pleasure but minus the guilt, what do you pair that with? I guess you can pair that with beer. That's a classic pairing in in, in Korea. Right. Chicken and beer is a chimak, we call it. And that's um, a famous pairing. But what we wanted to bring, once again, is um, something new. And we thought that champagne is perfect because the bubbles, the yeast in there, it really cuts the richness of the fried chicken really, really well. And I don't know about you, Scott, whenever I'm drinking champagne, it's a celebration. And uh, I feel like we all need more celebrations in our lives. We certainly do. And how are you how do you looking to grow that wine list? Like what's your strategy? So Gracious Hospitality Management is the name of my company. And our company's vision always is to, you know, be inclusive, right? So uh, we want to make sure that whether uh, you want to spend very little amount of money, whether you want to spend very large amount of money, whatever you're looking for, we're able to kind of meet you there. So we, Victoria James created this list called 100 under 100. Mm -hmm. So it's 100 different types of a sparkling wine, including champagne, obviously, um, that is priced at under 100. So you have so much to choose from. And of course, uh, we have the largest champagne list in America, uh, over 400 bottles. And we want to continuously focus on that. But as the restaurant matures and as we learn more about the preferences of our customers, Personally, I also like Lambrusco, you know, the, the effervescent yes, red wine, yes. the tannin, the effervescence also is really amazing for uh, fried chicken. So uh, we want to grow uh, with our vision, but we also want to grow uh, while we're really learning about what what do our customers want. And uh, I think that's a very important observation that we're, we're paying attention to. Do you ask them what they want? Absolutely. Yeah, we have uh, two sommeliers on every night. So our sommelier is there asking, trying to find their preferences. Also, uh, at upstairs, we're looking at the numbers, you know, what's selling, what's not selling. We, we, you know, we pay attention both qualitatively and quantitatively. So I've been to Coco Deck, and it really does look like an atmospheric cathedral with the main room organized in this symmetrical design that ends at a mirrored wall and kind of creates this dramatic infinity effect. So when you sat down with architecture and design from Rockwell Group, what was the design vision you conveyed to them and what was the approach they took? So first of all, David Rockwell is my hero, right? I, Growing up as a person, a restaurant, hospitality, FMB professional, David Rockwell is kind of the holy grail uh, uh, of the design yes. and hospitality. So I always admired him. And finally, I got a chance to meet him in person. And we really hit it off, right? Um, Go, uh, Simon Kim, we have this, uh, we have obviously preference for this uh, luxury ex experience, but we also have this uh, kind of um, uh, edginess that's very important to us. So, uh, whereas uh, David Rockwell has this uh, uh, uber luxurious and textural um, um, uh, magical quality to it. So together we wanted to create, basically the mandate was, David, I want to create the most exciting and most luxurious and almost the cathedral of fried chicken. And that was the mandate, but we wanted to make sure that this is not too uh, fussy, too pretentious or too luxurious, because at the end of the day, we're eating fried chicken. You know, how do we retain this casual vibe and warm and fuzzy vibe of eating fried chicken with your friends? but elevate that with uh, nuanced touches of uh, a luxurious feel, the light features and, and like bells and whistles. So that was uh, the intricate balance between fun, exciting, casual, but also uh, buttoned up, sexy, and uh, opulent. So that was the mandate. You know, over the decades, fried chicken has become ubiquitous and incredibly popular in Korea and among Korean communities in other countries. It's no news by now that the Korean kitchen has officially made landfall in the United States. The rise of Korean food in America is the latest in a string of East Asian influences on the American diet. And like every great food awakening, it began with baby steps, but is just now taking its place among the more established immigrant cuisines. Can you explain what's been driving the Korean cuisine boom over the last six or seven years and why it took so long? Sure. So in a nutshell, I believe Korean food is very much well balanced. I think it's um, uh, it's combination of uh, uh, fresh vegetables, pickled fermented uh, vegetables like changachi uh, and kimchi. Uh, it really kind of, as people become a little more aware of probiotics and prebiotics, you know, the fibers that um, gives uh, uh, food to the uh, probiotics and gut biome, 
uh, Korean food obviously is really um, seeing its uh, health benefits. Uh, also, it's got Korean barbecue that's really kind of um, interactive with fire, meat burning. It's very multi-sensory uh, stimulating. Also, Koreans love to have fun. You know, they love to get drunk. There's a big drinking culture there as well. And Korean culture as a whole has seen its um, golden age, if you will. And Scott, if you think about um, the golden age of a culture, there's more to it than just um, why, like the colorfulness of it. Mm -hmm. I feel like it follows this um, very similar trend. It's no different than Amer the USA and Japan the fully developed nation, right? So what happens if you look back is manufacturing sector really kind of um, uh, booms, right? Whether that is automotive, uh, whether that is Ford, whether that is Toyota, Sony, and they make lots of money. And what, what you do with that money is you flourish financial sector, right? The banks of the world, whether that is Goldman Sachs or whether that is uh, 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 Mitsui Sumitomo in, in Japan. And when, when that financial sector is uh, boom, that's when the profitability is not about uh, the labor and the cost, right? Because finance financial sector has a different way of a business model, if you will. When that booms, I feel like the country really has an ability to invest in its culture. So whether that is um, a movie like Hollywood, whether that is um, a food in Japan, I feel like similar thing happened with Korea, right? Korea, Samsung, Hyundai's the world um, created this um, uh, manufacturing and then Korean bank sector really got succeeded. And now there's an inflow of uh, investment in culture. And I think that is what we're seeing, you know, whether that is, you know, Netflix, Korean dramas, Korean movies, Korean food. I think that has us, you know, uh, really strong and profound growth that, that seems to be staying. So I want to move from fried chicken to steak. I know steak is also near and dear to your heart uh, and specifically Michelin starred Korean style steakhouse coat in Manhattan. It's one of the most successful restaurants in the city. Your path to opening this restaurant wasn't exactly a traditional one and almost reads like a movie script to me. You spent the first 13 years of your life in Seoul, Korea before moving to New York City. You said your father was a gastronome and would take you to fine dining restaurants at luxury hotels in Seoul, but you really didn't enjoy them as much as he did. You thought they were a little bit stiff and pretentious, and you prefer the Korean barbecue restaurants that were more fun, fiery, and interactive. Can you talk about those early days and how it sparked your love for hospitality and restaurants? Absolutely, Scott. I feel like my life was uh, truly a lot about um, identity crisis. Um, <laughs> and, and I feel like this is kind of true to many, but having a multicultural background, I think that was even more so, right? Whether, so I spent 13 years um, in, in Seoul. So I had, you know, pretty vibrant upbringing. I have lots of friends. I was um, a popular, popular kid in Korea. And when I was 13, I came to America and I had to settle and start all over again. So, and then I wasn't sure at some point, Am I Korean? Because when I would go to Korea, people saw an Americanized version of a uh, Korean in me. Right. And then when I would come back to America, people are like, no, you're not American, you're Korean. So I feel like I lived this life where uh, of conflicting identity. Same thing with um, fine dining and casual dining. I love to have fun with my friends. I work for chefs like Jean-Georges, Thomas Keller. My dad took me to fine dining restaurants. So like, what do I, what do I like? I like them both. And I, and I think that's when it all happened. Uh, I'm not Korean or American. I'm not a fine dining preferring person or casual dining preferring person. I feel like uh, I'm Korean and American and I love luxurious fine dining and uh, get down dirty uh, fun dining as well, right? I think that's basically what it all happened when, so basically when, when the, long-term identity crisis ended was when I fully welcomed both of my uh, identities and mm -hmm. embraced it. And that is what GOAT is. GOAT is the world's first Korean steakhouse. It's basically part Korean barbecue, the fun and fire of Korean barbecue, where you can let your hair down and have a blast with your friends and family or lovers. But it's also American steakhouse where beef is king. We have amazing dry aging room where dry age all of our meat and we have the highest quality of Japanese A5 
uh, to American Wagyu that's crossbred. So we have literally the best of both worlds, whether that is um, Korean barbecue, American steakhouse, amazing wine list or killer cocktail list and a beautiful um, a, a playlist of music. So if you want to get down and throw it down, you can have a lot of fun. And that's what Goat Korean Steakhouse is. And when you and your family moved to the United States in the 1990s, I'm sure your parents continue to take you to new fine dining restaurants in New York City. Which restaurants or chefs had the biggest impact on you during that period? Yeah, I'm very lucky to call two of my mentors who I work for um, had the, uh, the biggest impact as a, as a customer as well, as a student of restaurants. I mean, first one was um, obviously Chef Jean George. He's a dear friend of mine. He's my mentor. Learned so much from him. And his ability also to kind of imbue the Asian flavors and lightness, colors and flavors into classic French cuisine was groundbreaking. You know, now we see a lot of crossovers, but Jean Georges is the, the godfather of that crossover, right? So we yeah. can't talk about that crossover without him. And also, of course, Thomas Keller. He is the, he's like the, the man, the myth, and the legend. And he's the only American chef with two restaurants with three Michelin stars, one in Napa, one in here in New York. And from him, I learned so much about basically the, the work ethic, you know, how you derive at the, the crystallization of excellence is no secret. It's just about working hard and working focused and teamwork. So those two. The best. So what was what was your first introduction to the American Steakhouse? Oh, by far. So I moved from Korea when I was 13. I moved to Long Island, a town called Manhasset. Yep. And nearby, there was a local steakhouse. It was a very local. It was about a five-minute drive. But the local steakhouse was called um, Peter Luger. So I will go there as a high school student. I had no money, but I would save up my allowances. And I will do ch house chores and this and that and save up my money, and I will go to Peter Luger. And the um, waiter study was really hilarious, right? 60-year-old waiters, classic steakhouse waiter. <laughs> Here I am, I'm, I'm 15 years old, coming in and having steak uh, for two with a friend. Uh, it was a really fun, fun sight. But I fell in love with that st American steakhouse culture, and I thank Peter Luger for that. So at the time, did you travel to Manhattan and immerse yourself in the cuisine, culture, and nightlife of Koreatown? And I just want to, before you answer that, for listeners out there who may not be familiar with Koreatown in New York City, it's a small ethnic Korean area in midtown Manhattan birthed from the late mid-century immigration that has everything from Korean barbecue restaurants to karaoke lounges to Asian groceries all condensed into these, you know, two or three blocks it's a bustling destination food hub that stays open late into the night. So did you spend your time, any time there as well? Absolutely, Scott. I went to school. I went to college for three years at Baruch College before mm -hmm. I transferred out to uh, UNLV in Las Vegas. So uh, that three years, three and a half years, uh, and, uh, plus a couple of years leading up to that, I was um, definitely hitting the clubs and drinking the venues and uh uh, all the karaoke places and uh, restaurants and Korean barbecue restaurants. Definitely, I was a, a Koreatown kid. So did all that help in inspiring you at some day to launch this restaurant? You're experiencing different things. The American Steakhouse, uh, ideally with Peter Luger, Koreatown. Absolutely. But Korean Koreatown during that time almost gave me the reason to break out of it, right? Because... I was looking at different cuisines. I was obviously always very passionate about food, restaurant, cuisine, the chefs, and hospitality. And when I looked at Korean cuisine compared to other cuisines, like, for example, Japanese restaurants. We've had Michelin star Japanese restaurants for a very long time. Same thing with the French cuisine. Italian cuisine, forget about it. It's, it's New York cuisine. It's Italian cuisine, right. right? But I saw Korean cuisine was very much uh, only offered in K-Town, and it was very limited. Uh, as much as I enjoy the casualness of it, I thought that there was an opportunity to do something more because Korean food in Korea is very robust. There's high-end restaurants, they're casual restaurants, just like any other cuisine in the world. Uh, it's almost like in French, uh, in, when you go to France, there's a bistro that's a little yeah. more casual, that's more local. And then there's, there's brasserie, which is a little more complex with a little more wineless. 
Same thing with it Italian cuisine. You go to Italy, there's Tirateria that serves uh, casual venue things with limited wine list. And then there's a Restaurante. Kind of like same vein, I wanted to create quote, Korean steakhouse as opposed to Korean barbecue. If a Korean barbecue serves, you know, a casual barbecue experience, Korean steakhouse serves that regal uh, with amazing wine list. And that's basically those formative years definitely gave me, of course, inspirations, but more, you know, why can't we do better uh, of that, that purpose, if you will. And your career in the hospitality business really got kickstarted when you landed a job at MGM Grand Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Can you talk about your position at MGM and how you climbed your way up to running the upscale Japanese restaurant at the hotel? Sure. So first I said at front desk agent, uh, I was checking people in the room. The hotel had 5,044 rooms. It was a, it was a really uh, crazy and dynamic experience, if you will. Uh, but I was in front desk and I'm, I like to say hi. I'm just a generally a, a innately a friendly person and I'm in front desk. So everyone came through front desk. So I was saying, hi, Scott. Hi, so and so. Hi, so and so. -and -so. Buy so and so, buy so and so, and that was just basically just part of what I did, right? Why not? I'm there anyway, so why don't why don't we offer hospitality and a little bit of smile to everyone because uh, I'm there anyways? And soon I became a front desk manager there. And one day, VP of uh, Fine Dining, who was uh, walking through the lobby as per usual, came to me and said, "Simon, do you want to run a Japanese fine dining restaurant?" So I thought about it. I was like. Yes, I do. And I think uh, the rest <laughs> is history. And it was certainly an exhilarating ride while you were there. And while your time in Vegas ended abruptly, what did you learn about running a successful customer facing business? Vegas restaurant, casino restaurants are like nothing else because the environment of casino is like nothing else. There's no other places that really has a, a casino environment unless it's like cities like Macau or uh, a casino city, if you will. So I learned a great deal with, because the clientele is such a, a different demographics, especially in a hotel like MGM Grand, where rooms can be as low as under $100. The same room can sell for $1,000 during a fight night at MGM um, Grand Garden Arena, right? Yeah. So same thing with the, the restaurant. You would have someone who's looking for California roll and a Sapporo, and then uh, same night, uh, somebody was looking for a Magnum 1982 Lafitte and Japanese A5 Wagyu grilled and with special uh, requests. So I feel like that was uh, a great opportunity for me to uh, experience. It was like a boot camp for uh, all spectrum, whether you're looking for something really, really uh, casual and, and, and minimal or something that you're looking for a grand slam, like table of four, who's a casino guest who's willing to spend uh, $80,000 on a dinner because it's a form of a compensation. So I think that really prepared me for kind of a showbiz of restaurant business. And you moved back to New York and started working with some of the world's most well-respected restaurant owners and chefs, like you talked about before, Jean-Georges and Thomas Keller. These top restaurants personify refined cuisine, impeccable ambiance, and the very best in hospitality. Did your experience managing restaurants for these leaders and fine dining culture help you set out on your own with confidence? I can, I think uh, uh, help me set up is an understatement, right? I think those are the formative. I don't think um, I would be at all uh, being able to do what we do and be able to attract the people that we attract, the talents and the customers without having worked for some of the best chefs as well as a restaurateur. You know, Steve Hansen from Be Our Guest I learned a great deal from him as well. So I feel like um, if you have the passion to get better, there's nothing better than uh, working for uh, the rock stars that already has done it. So as I mentioned earlier, Chef Jean-Georges taught me to create magic by fusing different cultures, whimsical, the design, the, the sex appeal, and the, the, the modesty. And Jean-Georges taught me so much, as well as Thomas Keller. Uh, Chef Thomas Keller is one of my partners actually at Gokodak. And he, he taught me about the work ethics and the sense of excellence and how a perfect food is uh, does not exist. It's an only an idea. It's the pursuit that matters. And um, now I thoroughly enjoy the pursuit with my team. 
Piora, an Italian restaurant, was your first restaurant. And within two years, it earned its first Michelin star and maintained the ranking for the following two years. Unfortunately, it had some financial challenges and you had to shutter its doors after four years. But then Coat was born in 2017. And was Coat the type of Korean restaurant you envision owning for all these years? It, it, it really is. But before we talk about Coat, I want to talk about Piora. Uh, uh -huh. Piora was um, my baby. I opened that restaurant in 2013 when I was 30 years old. I was literally living and breathing there. I was there at every shift. I was dropping every dish along with my uh, then chef partner. And I gave my blood, sweat, and tear, and then some to that restaurant. Mm -hmm. And but I couldn't, I couldn't make any money. I knew how to please people. The restaurant was always busy, but I was not good at accounting nor how to create a business model that really uh, became profitable. So I ended up closing that restaurant, Scott. And closing a restaurant that's actually, you know, it had a Michelin star. You know, we got a Michelin star our second year. It was a great success uh, on the surface. And to close that restaurant was probably the saddest thing that I've ever done in my entire life. Felt like uh, euthanizing your own pet, if you will, you know, with your own fingers. And that was really sad, but I feel like that taught me so much. So my message to, uh, one of my very important message is, don't be afraid of failures because failures will teach you things that success will never be able to teach you. I feel like my biggest failure, probably what was one of the biggest was Pura and I learned great deal and how, what not to do because, you know, we all try to learn what to do, um, but we don't really learn what not to do. And I think uh, that was a, a great learning experience. And that really set me up for GOAT, which was my ultimate restaurant because that truly was who I am, you know, GOAT is who I am. It's a Korean American restaurant. And at GOAT, we don't aspire to become the most authentic Korean restaurant at all, because there are so many authentic restaurants in Korea opened by people who's been opening restaurants in Korea for generations. And I have no intention of trying to emulate what they do, nor Korean GOAT doesn't aspire to be an American steakhouse, authentic American steakhouse, because they're, that's not my lane. My lane is very clear. My lane is, a, I'm a Korean American. I'm a Korean and American. My Korean flavors are authentic. My American approach is authentic in its own. And my uh, ap appreciation for French wine is also authentic. And once you have those kind of uh, different elements and put it together, in my humble opinion, that epitomizes what New York is, right? New York is, you know, New York Italian never aspires to be the most authentic Italian restaurant. But it has created its own. And to me, uh, it's, 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 that's exciting because um, we find our purpose and our direction and our flavor from within, not uh, just by adopting something uh, from outside. And you said about Coat that you wanted to really provide for Americans that festive sense of how Koreans really celebrate life. So how does Coat do that? Yeah, so in Korea, uh, eating is more than just nourishment. Korea went through a lot of hardships. So eating is a little bit of a ritual. That's why we lay out different panchans, uh, which is a, a side dishes. Uh, along, so it's important to basically lay out the, the table. Uh, back in the days, uh, people would just, um, a noble family or, or the kings or, or, or royal cuisine, it was about um, bringing, basically, if I have you over, Scott, uh, with two of our, our friends, we would sit down and enjoy our each other's company and there would be a door knock. And then the chefs and the team would bring actually a giant table that's already placed. There's There will be no room for additional um, dish. Basically the entire giant table be packed with different ingredients and things. So it gives you the sense of a uh, uh, grand, grandeur. Yeah. And uh, Korean cuisine is unique in a sense that like in that setting, if you wanted a, uh, if you're a pescatarian, you can you can opt for pescatarian um, options. And if I'm a carnivore, I can opt, opt for carnivore. If you're a vegetarian, so basically the idea is to uh, bring the entire market into the the dining room table, and you eat what you eat. You know, so that like a festive, uh, the celebration um, was an important component that we adopt to uh, Korean steakhouse as well as a. Um, 
Gokodak. So when you come to our restaurant, you will notice the table gets really filled with um, uh, so many different components. And that gives you ability to eat what you want and a sense of celebration. And not too long after you opened Coat, the accolades were flying in. The restaurant earned a two-star review from the New York Times, three stars from New York Magazine, three stars from Eater, and the coveted Michelin star. In fact, Coat is the first and only Korean tabletop grill restaurant anywhere in the world that has been awarded a Michelin star. So how did earning that Michelin star influence your business? Well, first of all, what a great honor, right? I was so, so, so proud of our team and the mission because it was really difficult, Scott. When when I said, um, I'm going to do a fine dining Korean barbecue restaurant and, and turn that into Korean steakhouse, the naysayers were crazy. Basically, the only reason Korean barbecue is popular is because it's casual aspects, right? Mm -hmm. So I had a really difficult time raising capital, hiring, trying to make this thing work. It was really difficult so that when we finally opened, uh, it, it got a Michelin star in a few months of opening, accolades coming in, and it was uh, just a great validation. And it was a, a very grateful moment, if you will. Uh, and of course, Michelin star is uh, probably the greatest honor that restaurateur and chefs look for. And so it was uh, such an honor. And also it's extremely great for business. We we're always very busy, but um, Michelin star gives a different level of recognition and um, a clientele. So that was a, a great, great blessing, if you will. And getting caught up in the Michelin star game can be a sharp double-edged sword if owners don't navigate the win with a sound market understanding. How do you ensure that getting a star doesn't weigh down on your business model? As um, hard as this may sound, we try to we truly embrace this. You know, go, uh, the previous restaurant, Piora, had a Michelin star, and I had to close the restaurant down with a Michelin star. So, A, what I knew, what I know for a fact is that Michelin star does not pay for rent. So, right. I think the name of the game is, but once again, Michelin star is such a great honor, and of course, we all want to keep that. But... I think the name of the game is this. Uh, if we can continuously be authentically ourselves and do not compromise on quality and sense of excellence and our true desire and intention to bring happiness uh, and joy to our customers and our employees, then that's, that's our focus, right? And God forbid, and if we lose our star for whatever reason, I feel like as long as we have truly stayed on course to our mission, which is pleasing our customers and pleasing our um, employees and not compromising on our quality, then I feel like, um, you know, hopefully we'll get that back, right? So I don't think it's um, the award or accolade should not be your guiding principle. I feel like your guiding principle should be, you know, the, the, form, the basics that got you there at the first place. Does that make sense, Scott? Absolutely. And I want yeah. to talk to you about restaurant culture. And restaurant culture is the set of values that defines what it means to be in your restaurant environment. This includes elements like your company vision and mission and brand identity, beliefs and norms, systems and processes and things like that. And even the language used in your menus and signage and by your staff. How would you describe the restaurant culture of restaurants in the Gracious Hospitality Management Portfolio? Yes, great question, Scott. Culture, I feel like, is the most important thing because uh, I've done that in my previous restaurants where I was present all the time. And it was important for me to be in control of every aspect of the restaurant. I feel like chefs do the same thing. And I think that's a very noble approach. But while I believe it's noble, it's not sustainable because personally, it is as much of an arts and craft project but it's also a business. And I feel like um, creating a culture allows you to continuously grow, right? Because um, you know my, my manager one day needs to become a general manager and my general manager needs to become director of operations and whatever their aspiration may be, I want them to continuously be able to grow and I want to grow as a restaurateur as well, whether that is um, opening a restaurant in Singapore, having different concepts, so in order for us to continuously grow, um, really instilling a great culture is most important and also most difficult because you can't do that overnight. You can't fake it. You can't just um, 
pretend it. Uh, culture is the most profound thing. And we try to live that day in, day out to answer your question is what is the culture that we're trying to build is number one, care. Uh, everyone at, at Gracious Hospitality Management really must care because mm -hmm. um, if the 90% of the staff cares and 10% don't, uh, that cancer is going to really take over very quickly because yeah. it's so much easier to not care and allow someone else to carry your weight. So uh, it's so important that we surround ourselves with the people that share the same vision of care. So that's number one. And also we take our job very seriously, right? Uh, we don't think the restaurant job or hospitality job is not something that we fall onto it by default. We, we didn't become a restaurant worker because we didn't have anything better to do. We chose to become restaurant workers. We became, we chose to become hospitality professionals because this is what we choose to do. It's not any different than doctors, lawyers, bankers, and whatnot. Like this is our profession. And once again, uh, by um, truly embodying that that union of amazing professionals i feel like that is when you can really flourish your culture so yeah those are a little thing about our cultures so has owning and operating restaurants changed anything about how you think about your work or the role of fine dining and restaurants in people's lives so i firmly believe that food has this magical power to bring people together and Scott, I'm sure you agree with me. The more and more we advance, the more and more polarized our society become, mm -hmm. right? And we're we're and I feel like um I feel a great responsibility as a restaurateur to bring people together through good food and hospitality. And there's nothing that brings me more joy than a restaurant that's filled with so many diverse group of people, whether you're white black brown asian european whatnot like and everybody loves good food and whether your political view sexual orientation income level whatnot we just want to truly provide a place where people can come and enjoy their selves and company and i believe as the the society continuously evolves and technology continuously evolves the the need and importance of physical connection where you're breaking bread or breaking steak or breaking a uh, fried chicken together becomes <laughs> more and more important. Food solves all problems. Yes. I couldn't agree with you more. So what new endeavors do you have in the pipeline that you can actually talk about and how do you see your brand evolving? So immediately <clears throat> we have announced our um, crown drool project in 550 Madison. Mm -hmm. It's located in 56th and Madison Avenue, which in my humble opinion is probably the most um, premier location, if you will. What is it? So we're putting uh, multi-concepts in there. It's a 13,000 square foot space with three different restaurant concepts. And I cannot wait to share the more details with you as we progress. 2024? 2025, second half of 2025. Wow. Actually, I'm going to share a couple of couple of um, uh, uh, details. So we're going to bring GOAT, New York City's only Michelin star steakhouse there, as well as we're going to bring a Japanese chef, multi-Michelin star Japanese sushi chef. His name is Chef Yoshitake from the center of Ginza, Tokyo, mm -hmm. into midtown of Manhattan. This is the, the true and time-tested surf and turf <laughs> in, in a way that uh, has never seen before. So I'm very excited to share this. Simon, my final question, which I ask all my guests, is the luxury item question. And if you were stranded on a deserted island and you could only have one single luxury item with you, what would that luxury item be? It can't be any form of air or water transportation to get you off that island or anything that requires mobile service or you can call someone to get you off that island. It's just lonely you on this island with lots of sand, lots of palm trees, lots of ocean. What would that one single luxury item you would like to have with you? Yes, yeah, Scott, I'm a fan of this question. So I had an ample amount of time to think about it. And, without a, and, and the answer came out very short. It's my bed. 
uh, you know, uh, life on island may be uh, very dynamic or very boring, but either way, whether it's dynamic where I need a rest in my bed or it's very um, uh, uh, boring where I need to uh, sleep for a long time, I feel like a great bed, you know, especially as a restaurateur who's, who has a very active lifestyle. And unfortunately, I don't get to sleep many hours because I have restaurants in different time zones and et cetera. And always, my mind is always um, uh, working. So a great bed. Um, personally, I'm a huge fan of a Hastings bed. It's really, really expensive bed, but I feel like it gives you a type of rest that's, uh, uh, that is uh, pretty epic. So uh, as long as you, I got a really nice bed, I feel like uh, the next day I'm ready to take on the day, whatever that island life is going to give me. Simon Kim, owner and CEO of Gracious Hospitality Management. Thank you so much for joining me on The Luxury Item. Thank you, Scott. Much, much love. That's it for this episode of The Luxury Item Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this useful and entertaining, I would be really grateful if you can share it with a friend or colleague. I would love it if you subscribe so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other listeners find us. The Luxury Item Podcast is a production of Silvertone Consulting. I'm your host, Scott Kerr. Until next time.